Hi, I am Alex from Zengo, and today I'll be talking about Project Waltfacer and our experiments with demystifying general front-running bots. Today we'll be talking about what front-running is, just as a reminder, and about general front-runners. We'll talk about how we find them, how can we avoid them, what general front-runners are, and uh, their implications on the entire Ethereum ecosystem. So in case you're not familiar with what front running is, here's a short recap. In blockchains such as Ethereum and Bitcoin, transactions are mined by first uh, users broadcasting them to the entire network, where miners aggregate them in a transaction pool or mempool and select which transactions they want to include into blocks. Usually they include them by the order of the highest transaction uh, being ordered first in the block. And in case of Ethereum, this uh, determines which transaction happens first uh, or uh, in the order, which can determine the final state of the block. So how can someone who knows this fact take advantage of this transaction order? Or how does front funding work? So assume there is a user and they want to exchange a rather big amount of DAI for ETH on a decentralized exchange such as Uniswap. Someone who wants to take advantage of this fact knows that this high transaction will most likely cause the price of ETH to spike up. So the way to take advantage of that is to put in their transaction first or front run this transaction of the user, buy the ETH with what will, which is actually a discount on the, the price and eventually sell it or keep it or do whatever they want with it. So in this case, the user broadcasts their transaction to the mempool and the front running bot notices that transaction, broadcasts one transaction to front run the transaction and get into the block first with a higher fee, another one to get right after one, that one which sells the, the ETH back and they collect the profit. So uh, this is a sandwich attack which uh, is uh, becoming more and more popular and is quite well understood. This type of, uh, of uh, transaction where the ordering of transactions is, uh, is exploited to gain value from the blockchain is named minor extractable value or MEV as it was uh, named by uh, Phil Dayan in their paper Flash Voice. Uh, arbitrage, like you have seen with the, the sandwich attack and uh, liquidations are some of the more known types of, uh, of MEV. And uh, recently, uh, the initiative uh, Flashbots has uh, looked into these and is now surfacing all these types of uh, MEV extractions and more are to come. While this type of MEV is quite well understood, there are other uh, types of actors in the blockchain who are watching the mempool. And this is what we call the general front runners. So unlike arbitragers who look at specific DEXs or maybe a combination of DEXs, general front runners can look at any transactions in the mempool, look at contracts that maybe they have, haven't even interacted before ever or haven't studied in depth, uh, look into transactions that perhaps have secrets that are only known to the secret uh, issuer uh, and they can still extract MEV from these transactions. So some of the famous examples of uh, these types of general front runners recently have been uh, mentioned in the Ethereum Dark Forest uh, blog post by, uh, by Robertson and Georges who have described a case where they tried to uh, salvage some funds from, uh, from Uniswap and uh, encountered a front runner who has intercepted their transactions and uh, taken the funds first. Uh, Samsung's story describes a case where they were actually able to successfully extract these funds. So what's the basic way a general front runner could be built? So you build a bot, it uh, watches all the transactions in the mempool. In the most basic form, it can replace the original center of the transaction with itself, for example, its own address. 
analyze the profit, uh, see if they can gain anything from replacing the transaction themselves, and eventually do the front running. Now, the asterisk theory is that front running is not that easy. You can have to participate in gas wars and risky business, but that's generally the case. Now, uh, what can affect uh, the efficiency of the general front runner and how they see and execute and extract value from these transactions? So first of all, uh, is the transaction risk? So for example, how much gas would the transaction cost? If the transaction costs quite a lot, it might be obviously not profitable to even try and front run it. So uh, how much you can gain, how much would it cost is of course uh, important. And secondly, it's uh, the analysis time. So uh, transaction leaves on the mempool for sometimes quite a short uh, time. Uh, miners can uh, quickly pick it up and uh, mine it depending on how valuable it is, how much it pays, and of course, uh, some prob probability of when the next blocks comes, uh, comes around. Uh, and uh, the complexity of the transaction. So each transaction uh, can be more or less complex to analyze. And this can affect how fast can uh, front runners find it and understand that this is a transaction worth going after. So uh, as we said, uh, general front runners are trickier to catch. And uh, this is because it's harder to understand what is a general fr front runner when just looking back at the blockchain. So arbitrageurs, is, we can understand, okay, there was some arbitrage opportunity and it happened. But what uh, is different from uh, one uh, front-running bot to another? Why is one uh, transaction a general front-running attempt and one is not? Uh, this is what uh, we set out uh, to find out. So in our setup to uh, find track and, uh, and understand these bots, basically we set, set up some bait. Uh, the bait would be in the form of a smart contract that has some funds in it. And these funds will be locked with a secret that is only known to us. This means that uh, definitely there is no way, way for the front runner to know the secret in advance. And if they indeed try and front run us and extract these funds, this means it's because they are looking at transactions in general and not our contract in particular. So the setup is a, the, the contract that we use is quite, uh, is quite simple. Uh, we set up a, a, an image, which is a, a result of some uh, pre-image that only we know. And the way to extract the funds locked in the contract is, to, is by supplying this pre-image. Once the pre-image is supplied, the contract uh, funds are passed to uh, the message tender. So in our first attempt, uh, we tried to call the contract directly. We locked up some funds, uh, locked it up with the secret, put up some gas price and send a transaction to try and get our funds back. Interestingly, we were immediately front run. So uh, this is the result of uh, the front run of transactions as it can be seen on Etherscan. So there are some interesting things here. First of all, uh, obviously the, the bot has issued the transactions from, uh, from some EOA, but it has not issued it directly to our contract and rather to a proxy contract, which basically acts as a wallet for the front runner. The funds were then passed from the front runner's wallet to, uh, from our contract to the front runner's wallet. As you can see, we use 25 GUE. The front runner in this case used quite an exact amount more, exactly this much, way, way more uh, to front runners. And indeed it was the next transaction, uh, the, the, fir the, one, the first transaction before ours in the block when it uh, successfully front runners. Now that we have a tracker, so to speak, on this bot, we can look back at its history and we can see that it has been quite profitable, although not uh, too much over the course of its years and that it also has been operating for uh, quite some time now. Uh, back uh, as, as late as uh, 2018, which is quite interesting. Now, uh, looking at it, we can also analyze basically how the code of this wallet contract works. So besides some uh, other uh, constructors that uh, make sure that only the owner can use this proxy wallet, the execution function looks something like this. This is a slightly simplified version, but basically, 
it checks that the owner is indeed the owner of the smart contract. It records the Ethereum balance of this uh, contract before the execution, and then calls uh, the target uh, contract with some arguments. Uh, and this is basically where the front running comes in. So in our case, it was calling our contract with, uh, with the secret that, uh, that was needed to extract the funds. And uh, eventually it records the balance afterwards and checks that indeed this was profitable. So if uh, this uh, operation failed, uh, the transaction reverts and this guards this uh, proxy contract from losing funds unless in case it needs to supply some funds. Uh, the second attempt we wanted to make hard lives a little bit harder for the front runners. So we set up a proxy, basically uh, another contract that we would use to uh, call our contract that has the funds uh, and put, it, put, in, put in a slightly higher amount of ETH for it to be more lucrative for the front runners. Interestingly, uh, in this case, we were also front run and this, uh, unlike the previous case, which was a direct call to the contract, this time the bot was actually able to figure out what is the contract that has the funds and look into an internal call that moves these funds and uh, intercept this specific internal call to our contract and again, call their own proxy contract to uh, extract the funds quite similarly to the previous case. Uh, this bot is also a bit more interesting, first of all, because it is uh, quite more lucrative. So it has a, quite a nice uh, increase of ETH balance over the time of its existence. And it has uh, participated in some previous white hat uh, attacks, uh, white hat uh, extractions. So uh, during a, a case where a, a, a vulnerable contract um, had funds extracted from it by white hackers, this bot was also in on the action and has taken some of these funds to itself. Finally, uh, we made a setup that is quite similar to the bots itself, where we have a proxy contract, but we are the only owners of the contract and only we can uh, call it to try and extract for, uh, funds from, uh, from the, the, the vulnerable contract. Again, uh, this was open for anyone to take, but only we can use the proxy. And to make sure that we made it fair for all the general front runners, uh, we specifically put the, the gas price relatively low, so the transaction will be pending for quite a long time and uh, we'll give them time to analyze it and extract the, extract the funds if they, if they find it. Uh, this time we were successful. So the transaction was pending for seven minutes, which is uh, much longer than it has been with our previous attempt. And the payout was uh, slightly higher. Uh, but we were able to extract the funds. And uh, in this case, they were not sent back to the proxy wallet, but actually sent back to the EOA sending the original request. Uh, yet uh, we were able to take them out and um, be successful. So why didn't we get front run in this case? Well, it is an interesting question. Uh, it could be that uh, more sophisticated bots that could have analyze this transaction and figure out that in the internal calls and uh, did not do that simply because the payout was too small for them to get engaged. It could be that the complexity of the transaction was too, too much for the simpler bots to analyze uh, and they had some uh, limits on, on the type of simulation to make. Uh, it could be that they were busy doing something else, but uh, yeah. So it's kind of uh, hard to, to say, but uh, the fact is that in this case it worked, but it doesn't mean that it will work for anything else. Like this idea, uh, there, there are other ideas of how you can obfuscate transactions and make them more complex. Uh, some of them we tried and were successful for relatively small uh, funds. So one of them is, for example, using some kind of a, a smart wallet that can, that can execute basic, basically anything with a delicate call, a more complex movement of funds between, between contracts and accounts, some sort of a locking and unlocking mechanism where you have to 
unlock a transaction first before you can move on. And a, 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 some kind of a contract that self destructs after it extracts the funds, which might be more complicated to analyze. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, whatever we do, and even maybe presenting this stock itself, uh, might give the front runners an edge, and they can probably build some more complex uh, software to analyze these transactions and get more efficient at what they do. So uh, these uh, front runners were uh, rather simple. Looking back at their history, we see many failures of them uh, failing to to succeed and, and extract the value, maybe because there was more competition, maybe because um, they uh, got front run themselves, uh, but uh, even more sophisticated front runners that we have encountered, uh, take it a step further. For example, they can use cancellation transactions and notice when someone is trying to, to front run them and, and halt once they notice that the transaction is not, not uh, longer um, profitable, they can analyze ownership, which in our case stopped them from successfully front running, but is not really a barrier. And they can take uh, their analysis further and do uh, analyze these kinds of calls. Uh, in our case, we did not have to send funds to the contract for it to extract funds. Uh, but uh, which which makes it riskier for for the front runner because they are uh, risking sending funds before they can actually gain some value. But as we have seen uh, with with smart contracts, they can protect themselves by checking the balance before and after, which makes it slightly more difficult to try and uh, trap and actually make these miners. Uh, lose money when they are making these attempts, besides, of course, the, the funds that they spend on gas. Now, another approach to trying and obfuscate your transactions when dealing with smart contracts where you're trying to extract value is uh, dark pools or private transactions. So uh, one of them is, for example, the uh, Fleshbot bundles, which is slightly more complicated than uh, simple uh, dark pools. But the, the gist is, instead of uh, sending the transaction and broadcasting to the entire network, the transaction is sent directly to the miner and uh, the miner uh, secretly uh, includes it in a block when it's their turn to mine a block, uh, instead of uh, telling about it to everybody else. So other services such as, such as the Taichi network and the Blockstrap offer this service. And um, you can uh, use them to send transactions directly to miners and uh, not get front run. At least that's the idea. So what could be the problems uh, with the dark pools? So first of all, when uh, using one of these services, you are immediately marking the transaction as something that is potentially interesting. Unlike uh, the entire block, uh, entire mempool that can uh, contain uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, transactions, these are transactions that we we'll specifically mark as interesting and you say, okay, I want these uh, included uh, first. And you need to trust the relayer and the miner and the maybe other parties in the way to not, uh, take to not abuse their uh, power of uh, being the bottleneck of this, uh, of this uh, path and try to front uh, run the transaction themselves which is, would be also quite uh, difficult to, uh, to blame them. Uh, we, the miners can, uh, can uh, of course, do it in themselves, but they can also collude with the, anyone else or run their own bot. And there is no way to tell if they have done it or they have uh, colluded with some, someone else to uh, extract the same value. Uh, finally, there is also uh, a thought that must be given to the fact that not all MEV is bad. Uh, some MEV can actually be used to protect the protocol. And one such example is a recent uh, protocol called the MadeHTLC, which uh, uses the fact that transactions are broadcast and public in order to protect the protocol to perform HTLCs. So future directions uh, to look at. Um, we want to analyze the effect of general front runners uh, better. 
Uh, this can be done by excluding other factors, for example, not looking at the arbitrage and liquidations, or by tracing transactions within the same uh, blockchain and uh, figure out what has been a general front runner. In this case, uh, this has been uh, more of a trial and error and front runners that we have noticed, we have marked and we can now analyze and uh, look at their movement, but obviously they can always change the contract, can change their, uh, their account and uh, start the uh, start, uh, new operation. A uh, recent uh, work on exploring MEV in general. So there is a, there is the Flashbot uh, initiative, which are doing the MEV uh, explore and other great projects that look and surface all kinds of uh, statistics and uh, knowledge on MEV and newer work uh, and papers that have been uh, published on this matter also look into how prominent MEV is and what are its implications. These are some addresses of other front runners that we encountered during uh, this experiment, uh, all of them with the, their own quirks and features. And uh, finally, if you want to reach out and uh, talk about how you want to find general front runners or how do you want to attack uh, general front runners and defend against them, then that's the way you can uh, contact us either on the Zengo uh, channels or to me directly. Uh, thank you. I hope you enjoyed and learned something from this talk and have a great rest of the week.